You know, it's interesting. If you'd asked me this yesterday, I might have said my father. Okay. But as I'm sitting here today, I would like to say my mother. Okay. My mother, against all odds, left her very comfortable life, Oxford graduate, okay. gets on a plane to come to Africa to mm. just be here for two years, meets my father, mm. and could have not done that, could have chosen for a much more comfortable life in the UK. Mm. But she, she did that, did that against, against all odds. And I would say that I actually dedicate this podcast to my mom because I don't appreciate her enough. Mm. I, I was always very critical to her. Why doesn't we have money? Why don't we do this? Mm. Like, actually, looking back, I would like to dedicate this podcast to her. I'm truly grateful because if she hadn't taken such a step, Mm. The brave such an adventure mm. I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be the person I am mm. so mommy thank you if you ever watch this <laughs> before we get into this episode I'd like you to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss any future episodes hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Against All Odds my name is Daniel Coker your regular host. And before I introduce our guest for today, if you've clicked on the thumbnail for this video and uh, you've gotten this far, I'd encourage you to watch through to watch through till the end because there's definitely something that you can learn from this conversation. And um, our guest today is a very good friend of mine, actually someone that I grew up with and like a neighbor, a few houses down from where, from where I spent my early years on the university campus at the University of Ghana. Uh, our parents are actually both lecturers um, at the university. And our guest today is Catherine Engman. I've never asked you if you've got a, a middle name. I do. Okay, what's that? Atiede. 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 <laughs> I would never have imagined to get a question. <laughs> ah. Anyway, Catherine, <laughs> that's real funny. Catherine is an international governance advisor and an executive coach. She holds over, two, over 20 years experience in the area of corporate governance, uh, half of which was obtained working in FTSE listed companies in the UK. She's also the managing director and founder of Platinum Board Services, a boutique corporate governance advi and advisory leadership development firm, which is currently based in Ghana and serves internationally. Catherine also sits on a number of boards as a non-executive director and has a consultant role with the International Finance Corporation, IFC. This is the IFC in Washington, the real IFC. Not, yeah, not, the, yes, the not real, some, not Ghana IFC. Not, well, not, <laughs> yes, it's the real The IFC. proper IFC, yeah. IFC Washington. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then you're a big woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they tell me, but me, I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> where, where she's helping to build capacity in the area of ESG in the financial services sector. So for those of you who are watching who might not be familiar with ESG, ESG simply stands for the Environment, uh, so social, social and I Governance. Yes. Okay. Um, and maybe later on we'll talk about this. Um, Catherine also provides advisory services to boards um, in the area of our board evaluations, leadership development, and the transformation of corporate culture. She also coaches C-suite executives and founders. Her educational background is she has a degree in biotechnology and is also a graduate of the Chartered Governance Institute, previously ICSA. That's the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators, yes. okay, UK. Yeah. Uh, she also has several certifications in the area of human potential, cultural transformational tools, leadership development, and executive coaching. Catherine, welcome to Against All Odds. Oh, thank 
you for coming. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. You know, I, 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 we, we met. Um, we met him a few days ago. I'm not, yes. We've known each other for many years, but we we, we happened to be um, having a chat actually, yes. an outing. I think on last Friday night. Yes, it was. Yes. And yes. I just said, you know, do you want to do this? Yes. You know, and I'm always very cautious asking people to come on our podcast because sometimes people are shy. Some people, you know don't want to be associated with a public social media mm -hmm. platform and some people don't know why I'm doing this and, and, and all sorts <laughs> but you're crazy enough to to agree to to be interviewed yes, or to I have a conversation and I think it's such a privilege to be here so thank you for asking me yeah I appreciate that yeah and not, and for those of you who are watching as well I mean I've known Catherine a long time and uh, <laughs> like one of my oldest friends I know I mean she's like <laughs> And we don't talk every day, but you know, when, when, whenever we meet, we just pick up from where we last yes. left off, kind yes. of thing. Like, yes. That's kind of our friendship. Yes. And um, you know, she looks, you know, she looks mixed race. Well, she's mixed race, mm -hmm. and she looks very posh and all that. But don't be fooled. <laughs> you she, know my roots. She's a hustler. <laughs> totally. <laughs> she is a hustler, you know. And for for people watching, who might you know be living lives that are defined by other people and living lives in, in certain confines. Catherine is somebody who has kind of ventured out and is trying to do something. Like myself, we're, you know, if you go to a football stadium, right, there's people who are spectating and there are people who are playing. Okay, and people like you and I have chosen to be on the pitch and being on the pitch you're open to all sorts of criticisms. You're open. Your failures are seen by everybody. Your successes are seen by everybody. There's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of, you know, you have no idea that, 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 that what I have to go through to, to, to even have this podcast. That people have said all, all kinds of things. People have, some people are not supportive, but a lot are, are as well, you know, and that's kind of the environment that I think you and I are familiar with, you know, this mm -hmm. public space where you have to be in front of people, you have to take initiative. The road less traveled. <laughs> the road less traveled. <laughs> anyway, Catherine, tell us about your journey, your crazy journey. Okay, so I'll start with where I was born. Okay. I was born in a place called Cape Coast. Oh, okay. which, yes, I was born in Cape Coast. I bet you didn't know that either, did no, you? I, didn't know I was that. born in Cape Coast, and I'm the first of three girls. Okay. And we moved to Legon, where I met you when I was around eight or nine. Okay. So my first years were spent in Cape Coast. Okay. Now, my father was crazy enough. He, he's an academic, as you said, okay. but he was crazy enough to go into politics. Okay. So he joined the Le Mans government. And okay. so he was, we were a bit displaced by the coup in okay. 1981. Okay. And then in 19... So you run away? So, he, well, he didn't run away, actually. Okay. And because my mother's English, okay. right? You know yeah. my mother's like, my yeah. mixed race. Yeah. And I remember the day sitting around our dinner, ta um, dinner table in Legon, and there was an announcement that there's been a coup and all parliamentarians must report to the nearest police station. Mm -hmm. And a couple of my father's friends pitched up a, a few minutes later and said, oh, they were going across the border to Ivory Coast mm -hmm. and he should join. And my mother said, under no circumstances, Victor, will you join them? You <laughs> must do as you've been told and go to the nearest police station. Uh -huh. He went to the nearest police station and I didn't see him again for about three years. No way. Yes. No way. Yes. He was incarcerated? He was in, yes, yes. So he was in someone for that period of time. Okay. And I actually remember the day that he turned up when I, I didn't recognize him. <laughs> These soldiers turned up in an army vehicle yeah. and actually thought that they were coming to kill us, right? Yeah. Because we were quite fearful for our lives. Yeah. And I remember grabbing my um, my baby sister and my other sister, and yeah. we ran around the back of the house, running, 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 running. And suddenly, these soldiers jumped upon us, and I was like, "Please don't kill me! Don't kill me!" <laughs> and suddenly, we brought your father back. I was like, "Oh!" oh wow. So, but when he came back, he was still fearful for his life, mm -hmm. and so he then decided to go to Nigeria, like okay. all the Africans did. So, yeah. uh, pretty much, as much as I remember a lot about my dad. Mm -hmm. I pretty much didn't grow up with him mm -hmm. because for quite a few years he was in, in Sawam and mm -hmm. then afterwards he was in So for those of you who are watching who are not familiar with Sawam, yes, Sawam is a, like a medium security it is. Um, penitentiary. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh, prison, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. So did he come back a changed person? You know, was, he, was he broken? Was he... 
do you know, he was broken. Mm. He was broken. He lost all his confidence. Mm -hmm. He lost belief in his country. Gosh, mm -hmm. I'm actually getting very emotional as I say mm -hmm. this because he believed that he was doing something good for the country yeah. and then to be treated in that way. Mm. And he lost all faith in the political system as well. Mm. Mm. And yes, and so his confidence was gone actually, mm. completely mm. gone. And more importantly, he was so fearful for his life. I found his journals after he passed away mm -hmm. and they were very, very interesting about how much he feared for his life. Even when he went to Nigeria, mm -hmm. he kept getting reports about still people still looking for him and mm. he actually hadn't done anything, mm. Um, mm. anything wrong. I will have to say that I always used to say that we're the poorest politicians, <laughs> politicians' children because my father was so <laughs> Values that he instilled in me. <laughs> That's a rarity. <laughs> yes. Wow. It's sometimes much, much to their disadvantage. But as I say to people, I'd rather sleep well at night. Than worry. Than worry. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. yes. I see. Yes. So. So then I went off to England. Okay. And truly, going back to England was actually a financial decision. Going to England was a financial decision. Okay. So from Nigeria, your, your father went there. You got to Nigeria as well? No, I didn't. I stayed, oh, so stayed here. Yeah. Yeah. He... I went to motor school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then I went on summer holiday because one thing was that because my mother was an ex, well, she wasn't an expat living in Ghana. She mm. was, but she one thing that she managed to get mm -hmm. as part of her service package was flights back to England every, oh, okay. every summer, right? Oh, okay. So we would spend the summers in England. So okay. this particular summer, I went over to England and I remember packing to packing because I was looking forward to seeing my friends and yeah. I was packing gifts and stuff and my mm. mother called me to my grandmother's summer hat. Mm. Gosh, that sounds very posh, doesn't it? <laughs> but my grandmother had a summer, okay, a summer hat in the garden mm. and she told me that I wasn't going to be coming back to Ghana with them. Oh no. Yes. And at the time, I felt so sad mm -hmm. at the time. And I rem but I told her that, you know, mommy, I know that this is a very difficult decision to make. And I was only 13 at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mommy, this is a very difficult decision I know you're making, but I promise that one day I'll be, you'll be very proud of me and I'm going to work hard <laughs> because mm -hmm. I knew it was difficult for her. Mm -hmm. But that was what I said to her. But deep down, what I felt was, oh my gosh, this woman that I love so much is just leaving me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and so that, that was very, very, a very sad moment of my life. I put on a brave face as I do mm -hmm. with most things because I knew that that was a decision she had to make. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I So when you went to England, you went, you obviously went to school. Where did. where did you go to school? Just tell I, went to, like... I went to school in a place called Peterborough. Okay. Where at that time, there were really not that many yeah. black we had people of colour yeah. around. So I went to school in Peterborough. You and stayed with friends, family. My, oh, watch, thank you for asking. Yeah. My mother's brother and his wife. Okay, your uncle. Yes, okay. yes, my uncle. And again, you know, looking back at the time, I, they're both white. Okay. And at the time, when, at the, when I, was, I was experiencing it, I used to think, gosh, these people, they don't understand me. Mm. And even just where to do my hair, right? <laughs> I had to go and get some jerry curls. <laughs> <laughs> and this this kinky me, black hair. Telling, yeah, this kinky black hair. They're like, they couldn't understand my hair. Even buying hair products in those days was a challenge. You know, you couldn't find the hair products. I remember buying stuff from Boots, which really wasn't working. And at the time, I. I it, it's not resentment, but I just felt this desperate need to belong mm. because I was in an all-white school, well, there were about three mm. um, um, people of colour there. I felt this desperate need to belong and yet I just didn't belong. Mm. My accent was strange, mm -hmm. the food that I ate was strange, everything. I wanted, yeah, I wanted pepper, I couldn't even find <laughs> chili, that to give me funny paprika. <laughs> but when I look back now as an adult, looking back, I actually have so much gratitude for them mm -hmm. because there's this strange, and I use the word strange, or a person of a completely different culture. Mm -hmm. In those days, we didn't have the internet, there was no Google, there was mm -hmm. no YouTube. Mm -hmm. And this person is foisted on you with a completely different value system, mm -hmm. culture. I think they actually did really well. Mm -hmm. So I'm so grateful to them, mm -hmm. even though I may not have shown it at the time. But yeah. looking back, my heart is full of gratitude. Mm -hmm. So what happened after... Um after secondary school to university? So, yes, I went to university and I did a degree in biotechnology. Where, where I was started that? in the University of Westminster. Okay, I started London. off in Liverpool, yes. Okay. I started off in Liverpool and I really struggled in Liverpool. Really? Why is that? At the time, I, I just felt I did it again, I didn't belong in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. I felt this sense of. Um, 
race racism even from okay. even from my landlord because what had happened was that my mother in the summer had mm -hmm. come to look for my place to live for me mm -hmm. in, in Liverpool mm -hmm. and when I turned up the landlord was surprised that I was black and he actually told one of the girls in the house that I didn't realize that she was a darkie if she was she wouldn't have gotten this place really yes and then even looking at looking for work mm -hmm. I've never been someone to say that my color is working against me. Mm -hmm. But in, in those days, even looking for work and mm -hmm. feedback that I had from a couple of people was, mm -hmm. oh, and they said, you're okay, but you're a darkie. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I just didn't belong. Long, and, yeah. and also, you know, the challenge of being a nomad like I was, because remember, I didn't have a home. So I left, when I left my auntie and uncles, that was it. I was out, okay. yeah. I was out. So it wasn't a place so that that's I where your hustling started. And that's where my hustling started. Uh, that was where my hustling started. <laughs> so I was like, gosh, even in the summer, I have to go and look for accommodation elsewhere. I mean, it was just too much. I said, look, you know what? I want to go back. To, I want to go to London where my people are, where I felt like I belong. Okay. So that informed my decision. So it was my second year of university. Okay. I transferred to London. Okay. okay. You, you just sort of continued, didn't I you? just continued, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. yes. And you had a degree in biotechnology. What, yes. was, what was the thinking behind that? Was that you know, simply because, Anna? <laughs> well, I always had this romantic dream of being a French skincare scientist. And I believe that biotechnology was going to be the way. My dream was to work with Estee Lauder and be developing okay. these skin creams of the future using <laughs> biotechnology. Um, and I ended up being a governance consultant <laughs> instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Life and living it. <laughs> yeah. So that was the dream. <laughs> One thing about you that I admire is your pragmatism. You're just a, pra a practical person. Okay. You're, you're a bit like me. You know, I, I, I just believe in, you know, needs must. Mm -hmm. You know, and I believe you, you sort of um, followed your heart yeah. and, and created a space for yourself. Thank, so you, you, so thank you, you for noticing that. Thank I you. I'm observant. That. I'm observant. Okay. You know, I don't say say a lot, but I I, I I do observe a lot of things about people, uh, especially when you play golf with people. You can tell whether they're impatient, whether they're considerate, whether they're polite. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it's such a key attribute because. The nature of what we do is that we, we interact with people and yes. you've got to be able to read people and, yes. and, and know how to, you know, how to get the best out of them, yes. you know, without sort of foisting your preferences on them, you know, so it's just Very an art. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you worked in England for a while. Yes. And then again, you didn't belong. Interesting. <laughs> oh, 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 yes, oh. I, no, no, no. Do you know cut, what? Cut, okay, cut so. Cut in, so. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, I know we're on camera, and, um, but let's. Oh, were you following your heart? No. It wasn't It wasn't a love thing? No, it wasn't. You hadn't met somebody in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, no, I wish. I'll come to, I'll come to that story later. But when I, when I was working in England, it was very interesting because at the start of my career, and again, that was in 1998, 99, mm -hmm. and I remember going to events for the chartered Secretary, um, secretaries, yes. Yeah. And as much as a lot of Africans used to take that program, very few of them ended up in that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And I'd often go to events, and there'll be 500 people in the room, and I could spot... I could spot us. Thankfully, things have changed mm. a lot now. Mm. Mm. And I did come up against some challenges, mm -hmm. although I'm never someone that has normally says that my color works mm -hmm. against me. Because mm -hmm. I have I go in and I study the system and say, okay, this is how I'm expected to behave. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm going to behave because mm -hmm. I need to survive in the system. Mm -hmm. So that was initial my initial mm -hmm. the initial way that I approached life mm -hmm. was that, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm required because you, you've got to study the system because mm -hmm. at the end of the day mm -hmm. you've got to conform but the fact is that even though I was more qualified and this was in my later years I mm -hmm. discovered that there was a particular job I had where there were two of us doing exactly the same role mm -hmm. I was more qualified and more experienced and she was getting paid 30,000 pounds a year more than I was wow yes wow yes 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 wow. and then and so in that moment when I realized that, I was like okay well, clearly this company's not for me, I shall mm -hmm. move on. And that's that's the attitude I take. And the mm -hmm. thing is that I don't really blame people. Mm -hmm. It's really their conditioning, the way they're brought up. You just cannot, I don't believe that you cannot fight the system. You can make people aware of it. Mm -hmm. but you, I don't believe that you, 
the way to get through the system is to fight it. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. my belief. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, what was your experience initially moving back to to Ghana <sighs> uh, after so many years being away? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And um, you know, Ghana has its own its own uh, I'll call it madness. I mean, I I don't live here, but I, I come here so often. I was here a couple of months ago, and I happen to be here again. I, I, I say to people that even though I don't live here, I understand the way the system works and you just need a lot of patience and a lot of, um, don't have any high expectations, just go with the flow, um, don't look down on people, <laughs> just, just um, try to understand the, the, the social dynamics. But for somebody coming back to, to this system after so many years away, you know, how did you handle that shock to your system? Oh, Daniel, well, that's a great question. The first thing was that when I, when I first got back and I saw the system, the way things worked, I said to myself, wow, there's a lot that I can do to mm -hmm. make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do that. Okay. Of course, I got a little jaded along the way because okay. it's like, and what I realized is that if people don't want change, there's no way you can change the system, right? Yeah. So in terms of dealing with the shock, I don't know if I, if I have even still dealt with it because sometimes <laughs> I get very surprised. What struck me uh -huh. was that people, Ghanaians are really wonderful human beings, yeah. but I, don't understand, I didn't understand why it is that everybody wanted to cheat me, yeah. right? And yeah. so people were always looking to take advantage of me and I've got a very kind Because you're, you're, you're white. <laughs> That must be it, right? And I and I changed my accent. I, I deliberately made an attempt to sound so local. Like my mom says, "Wow, Catherine, you sound so Ghanaian now." Because I really made it an effort yeah. to sound more local, so yeah. that people would accept me, yeah. accept me more. So just like you said, dealing with the shock. First of all, when I first got back, it's like, nope, I'm fighting it. Yeah. You have to do it this way. You've yeah. got to be like this. And I was after a while, I was like, Catherine, this one of my friends told me. He's yeah. a lawyer, and in fact, he, he was one of the people that was instrumental in me staying, staying, staying here. Yeah. He told me that, Catherine, in Ghana, when you get on the aeroplane from mm -hmm. England, mm -hmm. everything you know, turn it upside down yeah. and have no expectations. Yeah. Just go with the flow because yeah. the system is going to kill you. Yeah. And the truth is that in three years, I actually wanted to return back to England. Okay. I, was, I, was I was done, done, yeah. done, yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. But the British, my passport, British passport had expired, and the British would not renew it. They thought I was... A fake, I wasn't me. <laughs> I was a fraud. It took me three years to get my British passport. Really? So, yeah, so 2013 to 2016, I was fighting to get my British passport. <laughs> but by then, Johnny had become, I'd gotten into the system. So. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, yeah. why, why, why did they do that? Because I was like, okay, so because my mother's English and so yeah. we were naturalized here. Okay. And the old certificate I had was so old, it wasn't digital in those days. Okay. That was what I sent. They really thought they were being very careful because of the old, old British. I had an old British. No, that had also gone missing. That had also gone oh, missing. So that okay, had okay, added an okay. extra okay. layer of complexity. Okay, okay. Yes, because kind of that went lost in a mood. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. I would have said that. I mean, if you had a British passport already, yes. you just put it down and. Yes, and yes. So that okay. was it. Yes. Okay, that yes, explains yes, that. Yes. So it wasn't until the final days when a friend said to me, oh, Catherine, just write to them and give them a very, tell them my very strong words that like you're a British citizen and you're going to take them to court if they don't give you a nationality. Yeah. So I wrote to them and I said, I am a British citizen. Here's my national insurance number. I've been paying taxes in England yeah. for X number of years. I demand my passport because it is my right and I'll yeah. be taking legal action against you. The next day I got an email. The passport is on its way. Pick it up. I was like, ah, is that all it took? <laughs> 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 But I learned a lesson mm -hmm. in that moment as well, mm -hmm. that when you're really stuck mm -hmm. on something, don't be shy mm -hmm. of speaking out about mm -hmm. it, because mm -hmm. I was a little bit embarrassed about that. Mm -hmm. But once I started asking people, I mm -hmm. got the right, I got the advice. Mm -hmm. which I so what, what, what do you think about um, the cultural differences, obviously, between you live in both, both parts of the world and, and all that. And I, mean, I, I, I tend to relate to people from different backgrounds as well, and I, I tend to see it differences in cultural attitudes. So for instance, um, a typical characteristic of people from this part of the world is that they'll tell you something, but they don't do it, or they have no intention of doing it. And 
sometimes I wonder why if someone is going to disappoint you, he doesn't tell you that, look, I can't do it for A, B, or C reasons. And then you accept it or deal with that. But they'll rather string you along and tell you, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. When they know that they have no intention whatsoever. That's a form of gaslighting, isn't it? You think so? It is, it is. And mm. the reason, because I've been thinking about that point really, really deeply. Mm. Why do you not just tell me up front? And look, here's the thing, what I've noticed is that because we're such amiable people, mm -hmm. in the moment we feel bad. Mm. There's a form of not being able to say no, right? Yeah, but why? I know. It's, it's just because when, when you say no, I think when we were growing up, and particularly people from certain mm -hmm. parts, they were not allowed to really fully express. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think. And so when you said no, you were maybe beaten. Mm -hmm. So you think that, okay, I don't have any rights. I can't say no. Mm -hmm. But then you become an adult mm -hmm. and it's all these people please like, oh, maybe if I say no, I'm a bad person, mm -hmm. right? Because we get that, um, no, if I, because I, I experienced that a lot. Mm -hmm. So you would rather not avoid the thing. Mm -hmm. So you'd rather say yes and completely go to the person. It's a form of gaslighting. And, I think and the last time I was here, right, I, I was supposed to interview 20 people. I flew all the way from England to interview 20 people. Um, we agreed, we agreed to be interviewed. And I told them when I arrived, and they said, oh, I'm at a board meeting, uh, call me at 2 o'clock. I call at 2 o'clock, I can't get through. They said, oh, I'll call you back in five minutes, they don't call. That, 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 that. Little by little by little. You know, they all excuses, excuses. I've got to go here. There's a few more here. There's, there's here. There's a, that. And I've traveled all the way from England. I'm here for a limited time frame. I need to go back. You know, and in the end, it was just Wagus. He was the only person who, who kept his word. You know, and everybody else, you know, told me kind of okay. Well, Joe Nettie, we've had to reschedule because he was generally busy, but. I just don't get it. I just don't get why people don't shoot straight. You know, if, if let your yay be yay, let your nay be nay. I mean, it's not, it's not by force. I mean, we agreed to do this. And if you had said no, I'd say fine. Absolutely. You know, I've, had, I've asked people and they said, look, you know, I'm politically connected. I can't come on a podcast. I understand that. I respect that. You know, and that's cool. But if you keep saying to somebody, oh, I'll do it, you know, I'll call you back, I'll do this. And you have no intention of doing that. And I think that's just... It's painful. It's really, really painful. I agree with you. I, I just don't know, know why it is. And that's something that we actually have to work on as a nation because I think mm. it affects everybody, the leadership. Imagine if you're working for a manager mm. who keeps promising to do things mm. and then doesn't do them. Mm. It's rampant. Mm. So, and it's very, very painful. Mm. But I, I like what you just said, let your yay be your yay and your no be your no, right? Mm. You just tell us that in the good book. Yeah. Um, and we're so crazy, we're such a religious nation, mm. and don't get me started on that. Mm. But yet, I, seem, I, seem, I feel like we've lost a lot of our values. Mm. And I think that, you know, you and I, we grew up in the same place, same background, similar backgrounds. I somehow feel that a lot of our value system has been eroded, and that's mm. some work that needs to be done, is really getting back to our original, what are our values, mm. right? Mm. So that's work that in my heart and in my dream is creating mm. a transformational change mm. by getting people reacquainted with their values, through mm. values. Yeah. Mm. So the reason I ask this question is, uh, and I'm not a trained journalist, but I'm learning. Mm. I'm learning. The reason I ask this question is that one of the things I know you do is you help companies transform their culture. Okay. And I've only ever once worked in a Ghanaian organization and it was a fairly small outfit and as we just said people have certain attitudes a very laid-back attitude um, very laissez-faire attitude and I mean not everybody's like that not everybody's like that don't get me wrong I mean I've, I've met some very sharp people I was with Sir Sam Jonah yesterday um, so I met him somewhere yesterday and I'm meeting him again tomorrow um, there are lots of people who are at the cutting edge of what they do, but in most organizations, there's this culture of, let me just do the barest minimum to get things done, you know? And then the second thing I've also noticed is that, uh, people don't have a solution 
approach. When there's a problem, they, they don't think about the solution. They think, oh, I need to get a new one. Uh, it, it needs to be replaced. You know, uh, or this needs to be done, or that needs to be done, or it can't be done. You know, I, I'll give you some example. So, my mother's obviously not well, and um, she sort of has a hospital bed at home, which she you know, she needs for her nursing care. And um, I got this, there's a bit of the bed that wasn't functional, so I, I got a repair guy to come and have a look at it. And then he goes, oh, you know, it's broken, you know, so I'm going to try and glue something, you know. And I saw what he was trying to do, and he's tried to do it several times before, but it lasts one day, okay. And that was his approach. But then I said, this won't work. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an, an engineer, I'm not a technical person, but my thinking told me that what he was doing had no longevity and was not going to work and was not the right solution. The right solution was to find a place that had an old disused similar hospital bed with that part where we can get that part, you know, we can strip it and get that part. That's, 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 that's my thinking. You know, so I made one call, you know, and that was it. So somebody who owned the hospital said, oh no, I'll send someone around or you can send someone around and we got the part of an old bed that they had, whatever it is, and that solved the problem. But then the thinking was that, let me try and fix this broken thing or... It's surface. Surface. Yes, so it's the solutions are always surface, surface. level, not deep. rather not deep, yes. Not going to the right what's issue. Your, what's, your, what's your thinking about that? Education, Daniel. Mm. Education, because mm. a lot of the education system here is by two poor paths. Forget. Okay. They're not getting you to think through... through your, your mind and this may sound very disrespectful but I remember my nephew being seven years old and he came to Ghana there's an issue with my handbag mm -hmm. and he was able to tell me what was causing that issue seven years old wow. and he actually had better thinking than my graduate staff mm -hmm. and it's all about I believe the, the crux of it is education mm -hmm. because the education system doesn't allow us to think mm -hmm. and process properly. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's my belief. It's, it's, so how does this filter down? Because like I said, some of the people who have let me down and gone big time are like CEOs, directors, I know, top people. A lot of these people have schooled abroad as well. They've gone to Oxford, they've gone to LSE, you know, out of thought that they'll have... Okay, so I'm not letting you down that cultural, because I come from that sort of environment, right? And we're speaking person to person. Why don't you just shoot straight? Can I ask you this, yeah. now, Daniel? Yeah. When you look at where we grew up, yeah. do those people have, do they grow up in the same way that we grew up? I would expect so. I mean, I, I, I think they grew up if probably even more affluent. Because they live in airport, air residential. Affluence doesn't bring you values. Mm. Remember how we grew up on this in this bubble, right? Yeah. Where we were surrounded by academics. With the circles and yes, all those people, yeah. Exactly. With yeah. a deep value, with a value system. Mm. But these people maybe it's a completely different value system and mm. I, I say that just because you grew up in affluence doesn't necessarily mean that you've grown up with certain values instilled mm. in, mm. in you. Mm. So I hear you that mm. it's the seers etc and what I find is that as well in Ghana we kind of have a fixed mindset you know mm. I really believe in a growth mindset that we can constantly grow evolve mm. and learn. A lot of people have this I have arrived mindset mm -hmm. and so because of that they are willing to explore and be and do things differently. Mm -hmm. So for example, may, maybe these people have an arrived mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being judgmental here, mm -hmm. but perhaps it's that, I'm sorry to say that big manism, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, so I can say strange. what I say. It, it is strange. It's just strange. It, I, I, I do with all sorts of people. I mean, I, I, people like Ellie Kemp, great people, but Ellie Kemp shoots straight. Yes. He shoots yes. straight. I mean, he, he's, yeah. um, I'm, I'm seeing him later as well. I mean, he, he says it as it is, it's and I, I, I appreciate that, you know, and he's decisive. Okay, that's, yes. a point of, that's the word I'm looking for. Decisive. Decisive. But what does the, and decisive. Where does that come from? That comes from courage. Being decisive comes from courage. Mm. And I think a lot of our issues, in fact, as I'm thinking about it, sorry to tell you, I get yeah. very emotional about this, yeah. not very passionate, is that a lot of these issues are also caused by low self-esteem. 
Oh, okay. Right? Okay. So even though I may have all the trappings externally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. deep, deep down, subconsciously, there's a low self-esteem. So I'm unable to be decisive or I'm unable to say exactly what I'm thinking because mm -hmm. I don't want to be labeled as bad, yet I'll still let people down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's so difficult. So I, I hear you, and I think mm -hmm. I think a lot of it also is, is to do with low self esteem, as I think about it mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Because when when you have developed that mm -hmm. that inner, and I'm not talking about confidence. Confidence mm -hmm. is very different from self esteem. Mm -hmm. When you have developed that, you're you're happy to mm -hmm. just be who you are, mm -hmm. and you know, I guess within a box, right, in context yeah, of values. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm like, for example, with me, I've had to do a lot of work mm -hmm. on my self-esteem mm -hmm. because I did have that people-pleasing thing, okay. except that I would say yes and do it. Okay. So I'd end up okay. getting burnt out, etc. because mm -hmm. I couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. I just kept doing, 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 mm -hmm. and it affecting me. Mm -hmm. And now that I've really worked on my inner being and my mm -hmm. self-esteem, I now have so much more courage in saying no mm. and knowing that I'm okay mm. even when I say no mm. and that you're not going to dislike me mm. before because I say no and if you do that's your problem mm. it's not mine because mm. I haven't done anything bad mm. I'm much much better now at setting mm. boundaries mm. So I'm going to be people from all over the world and a characteristic I see of people who have succeeded against all odds and that's the name of this podcast you know against yes. all odds is that more often than not they tend to be people who are decisive Okay, so I say to them, um, here's what we're doing, and in, in a heartbeat, they tell me, yes, I'll do it, or no, I can't do it for, or I can't do it now, but I can do it in three months' time, or I can do it in six months' time, which is fine, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. But then, there's that element of decisiveness. There's a lot of people who might be watching this, you know, watching this, this podcast, you know, and have dreams, goals, things they want to do, and guess what? They don't do anything about it. You know, they just dream and stay in the realm of dreams, right? I mean, even in the real world, when you dream, you wake up, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes I wish I did because my dreams are sweet. That's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta wake up and, and, and smell the coffee and, 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 you know, be realistic about it. But I mean, what can you tell us about decisiveness as a, a, a takeaway for somebody watching this, you know, who's been talking about something, talking about something, but doesn't do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not a trained journalist. If you told me a few months ago that I'll be sitting here with you doing this, I'd have told you you lost your mind, okay? Because I had no interest. I'm not, I've got no interest in putting myself out for, the, for public scrutiny. I don't, I'm not doing this for money. I'm not getting anything out of this in any way, shape or form. And these, this, part, this platform is not about me talking. I just ask questions. That's all I do. I don't promote myself in any way, shape, or form, you know. And but I decided to do it, you know, on the spare of a moment in Portugal, you know. And, and it took me two minutes. I said, I'm going to do this, you know. Whether people are with me or not, whether people support me or not, I will do it. And we come on every week. Can you imagine? Every week, I've got to find content, right? And it takes a lot to make that happen. Yes. But I was decisive. Yes. Okay, I might fail. We, this is the early days, you know, you and know. We're, 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 we're doing reasonably well. But even if it doesn't work out, I have no regrets because I took a decision and I'm prepared to live by the, by, by, by the consequences. But tell you, what I know about you mm. is that there's nothing that you put your mind to mm. that you don't achieve. Once you mm. make a decision and you mm. start mm. against the odds, mm. you're going to achieve it, mm. right? It's like, <laughs> it's like your goal. So <laughs> whatever you say, this podcast will succeed mm. because of that mindset that you mm. have, because mm. you are going to learn from the things that don't go so well mm -hmm. and you'll improve on them, yeah. right? So yeah. you have a learning mindset. Mm. So you continually evolve. Mm. So it's, it's never going to fail. So it's always mm. going to be succeed. Mm. So... No, I mean, so, yeah. so just a little bit about decisiveness. Is there anything you can tell our audience? Ah, decisiveness. Okay. I think, was it Napoleon Hill who said that the secret to all goal achievement mm -hmm. is to decide. You decide and you, you take action. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do not make that decision. So they have wishes. If wishes were horses, beggars yeah. would ride. Yeah. They have wishes, but they do not decide. They do not take the action, mm -hmm. right? And I think that action, again, it all comes down to courage. There's fear that I'll fail. Daniel, I wanted to do a podcast since 2016. Mm. 
I bought the equipment. I bought those like, Zoom whatever things, <laughs> yeah. Zoom things. And then I just, I didn't take action. I didn't take action because every single week I had an excuse. Mm. And the excuse was, okay, I don't know what to call it. I don't know who I'm serving. I don't know this, you know, overcomplicating it. Mm -hmm. And it's because, and so I didn't take action because of my fear of failing. Okay. Right. Okay. So you have inspired me mm -hmm. to, to go. But, I, but there are many, many, many areas of my life that when I decide to do something, I just do it. Some, okay. And I always say that do, what, I learned, what I'm learning is do not overthink it. Mm -hmm. If it's something that you truly want, mm -hmm. and it's because you want it and not because society says you should have it or, you know, Daniel's got a podcast, so I've got to start my podcast. If mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't align with your, the vision that you have of yourself, mm -hmm. or your deepest values, then it's much more difficult to take action. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, I think it's got to align. And if it does align, you know what? Just do it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You would have become a much more, you would become a much better person mm -hmm. or a much more evolved person in the process from all the lessons you've learned. Mm -hmm. Because when I decided to go down the coaching, become an executive coach, yeah. everyone told me that, Catherine, this thing is just not going to work. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't do it. In Ghana, people don't use coaches. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I thought that it was so aligned with who I was as a human being, aligned with my values of compassion and helping people get the best out of themselves, mm -hmm. that I just did it. And like 10 years later, I have absolutely no regrets. Mm -hmm. And the people that were the naysayers mm -hmm. are actually saying, wow, Catherine, you really pursued that, well done. Mm -hmm. But that was something that was truly aligned with who I am. Mm -hmm. So back to the thing about me not starting the podcast, yeah. the other day I asked myself, Catherine, truly, why did you not start it? Mm -hmm. And the truth is that I'm not sure that it, at the time, it was really something that I wanted to do is because my marketing coach kept telling me, no, everybody needs a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to get moved. If you're a coach, you need a podcast. So yeah. I think that at the time it wasn't right for me. Okay. So there's sometimes that there's a decision to be made and where you are in the moment of your life mm -hmm. is that it's not, it's not necessarily the right time to take action. Mm -hmm. And I know that if it's truly yours to have, mm -hmm. it will find you. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's what I believe. How, how, that's, that's, that's very insightful. How do you also deal with people who um, might not, okay, let, let me phrase this carefully. So, for instance, if somebody does something um, who's outside of your circle, people of our background tend to support those people more than they do our own. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that this podcast gives good content. I think so. Yes. I'm does. probably biased. Okay, <laughs> and so you should but, be. <laughs> but I think that, you know, for people who are, who are really new to the game and all that, you know, we are trying. You know, but I tend to find that there's more of a receptivity for somebody who speaks in a certain way or who is have an American accent, or that's this, or that's that. You know, I know people in Ghana who have coaches in the UK and the US, and they fly first class to go see their coaches. But then you're here. Yeah, exactly. So why don't they come to you? That's it's a similar kind of thing. I don't know if, if you I, I totally agree. And you know what? It, and exactly it. I, I I I gave up trying to find people here because you know even the Bible, a prophet is not recognized in their own town. Even Jesus was not recognized by the yeah. I guess so. I guess so. so. <laughs> it's, it's one day. One day they will come to me. Mm -hmm. But as of now, I, yeah, exactly. Because it does irk me. Because one of the reasons mm -hmm. I became an executive here in Ghana was mm -hmm. because people were also flying the coaches mm -hmm. in a flying first class, paying them a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. I said, gosh, but what if I could provide that? Mm -hmm. And the truth is that I also have the local context. So I, in fact, I think, Daniel, no, I think, I know that I'm a really good coach. Mm -hmm. But luckily, yeah. I also mm -hmm. have my, I have my clients in Canada, America, mm -hmm. England, and I've got one in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I, I see that, yes. And, and I think another thing as well is that people, you know, they just want to be attached to maybe celebrity or say, yes, I'm flying first class to go and mm. see my coach. Mm. If they're just getting in their car, coming to here. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound, you know, and you know, sometimes we sell training. Yeah. And you know what? People would rather fly. Yeah. So if I organize a training course in Dubai, people will come. Okay. More than they will come here. And okay. I, you know, I think that I better have the ear because yeah. it provides ease, access. Yeah. Oh, no, no, But let's go and do it in Dubai. Dubai. Yeah. <laughs> Shopping, exactly. shopping, <laughs> pictures. <laughs> uh, so if you're enjoying this episode, I'd like you to hit the subscribe button 
and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss any future episodes. Uh, so Kathy, what motivates you? Okay. I'm going to change your question okay. to ask you what inspires me. Because okay. motivation is from the outside in and inspiration okay. is from the inside out, right? Okay. In spirit. Okay. So what really inspires me, to be honest, is or what shall I say, what gets me going every morning mm -hmm. is knowing that knowing that I can make a difference in my little corner and that anyone who comes into contact with me leaves better off than when they arrive. Okay. And so I would say that whenever anyone meets me, they should always walk away a slightly with something, mm -hmm. not financial, but walk mm -hmm. away maybe with encouragement. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, what it, that's what inspires me really. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I love nature, I love mm -hmm. the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really what inspires me. I think that's what's really, I am waffling, but I, that's what I get up every morning. Mm -hmm. And I feel that I am truly living the life of my dreams mm. right now. Mm. Yes, it's not coming with the cash, 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 yeah, yeah. I expect to do that, but it will come. I ask myself, and this, when I look back at my journals from 10 years ago, mm. this is exactly the life that I wanted. Mm. And I'm like, wow, God, thank you so much. Mm. And so what I realize is well, that is that the vision mm -hmm. is for the appointed, it's just really true that the vision mm. is for the appointed time. It will not come overnight mm -hmm. like you expect it, but you've got to continuously take action mm -hmm. and eventually at the right time, mm -hmm. it will manifest, but it requires you to be a completely different person mm. because the person I am today is not the person I was 10 years mm -hmm. ago. Does that make sense? That's, that's deep. That's deep. What well, you've said a few times in this conversation is that um, your journals, you refer to your journals of a dad, and you mm. just said you looked at your journals. And I, I picked that up. Interesting. Okay. What is it about writing things down? You know, what is it about mm. documenting things? Yeah. yeah. I, I somehow, again, I don't, you know, this may sound woo woo. Okay, so for me, one thing about documenting things is that I would say that the faintest pencil is stronger than the, um, <laughs> the strongest mind. The okay. faintest pencil um, is more, yeah, it has, it has more memory than the, <laughs> the okay. strongest mind. Okay. Basically, if you write things down, you're less likely to forget. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I've found about writing is that I'm even someone that writes my prayers. You know, like some people that able to say everything that they mm. want. I actually write my prayers. And mm -hmm. so I write, dear God, I'm struggling with this, this, this. And somehow it's almost as though God gives me an answer and I'm writing the responses. Okay. So okay. I find I love writing mm -hmm. only because it, and also because it helps clear my mind because sometimes there's a lot of chatter mm -hmm. in my head. Mm -hmm. And so by writing things down, sometimes it's very incoherent, but by writing it down, it just gets it all out of here mm. and into here. Mm. And yeah, and I think it's something that I must have subconsciously picked up from my dad. Mm. I didn't consciously know that he wrote a lot of mm. journals and mm. stuff, but mm. he does. And I'm so glad that I've been, I've been writing them. You know, sometimes I find them from when I was 20. I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> oh. And, and I, I, I do believe that there's that, there's that mind connection, mm -hmm. a spirit connection to writing things down. Mm. That's what I think. And it slows down my thinking. So it's like a form of prayer. Okay. okay. Have you ever sort of had to deal with loneliness on this entrepreneurial journey? Ah, yes now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. You know what? It's so freaking lonely because especially two things, your friends that are in corporate, mm. right, mm. do not understand your challenges mm. at all. Mm. And so they can and then you've also got friends that you know, I'm in the professional services business. Okay. So basically if I don't work, money yeah. Money's not arriving. Yeah. Whereas you yeah. have other people that run yeah. different types of enterprises. Yeah. I, well, yes, in the early years of my journey, I didn't have mentors, I didn't have coaches. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't realize that there were people that you could talk to. So, yes, I have had to deal with a lot of loneliness. I have cried. Mm -hmm. I have woken up in the mornings and said, no, business is closing down. <laughs> and it's, it's been so lonely. But then, and not but then. Mm -hmm finding friends who were also on a similar journey. So I've reconnected with, well, I reconnected with a few of my friends in England. Okay. And it's amazing that you realize that, gosh, we all feel lonely mm. because people don't really understand our battles, particularly running a small business. Mm. It's completely different to running a, 
a large corporate mm -hmm. or being in a corporate mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. short, um, long answer to your question is absolutely. Mm -hmm. The journey is a lonely one, mm -hmm. yet finding people who are aligned mm -hmm. can take that that off. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess that's how why we all have mentors and coaches and, and mm -hmm. join groups and communities. So that's why I think the entrepreneurial communities are really useful for people because mm -hmm. you realize, I mean, uh, um, a program for strategic coach in the UK. Okay. It's founded by a guy called Dan Sullivan. And so we meet in the UK every quarter, once okay. a day, talking about our goals, our dreams. And it's amazing. Everybody's going through the same struggles. Okay. And it's joining that program that I realized that, oh, Catherine, you're normal. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so that's yeah. been such a blessing. And yeah. I, that's a community that I really love because mm. now that I'm in that community, I don't feel alone. Mm. But you mm. have to pay good money to join us. I, I can imagine. <laughs> Like it's well worth it. It's well no, worth it's, it. You know, it's the people. People like things for free, but sometimes you need to pay for something to get a certain outcome. Exactly, because yeah. you know, Daniel, yeah. knowing that I have to pay so much a year. Mm. Do you know when they send me work, I do it mm -hmm. because I'm going to get the most out of it. <laughs> if I were paying two hundred dollars for it, yeah. uh, I wouldn't be bothered. Yeah, yeah. But the investment is so high mm -hmm. that I make sure I do the work, mm -hmm. and it's in doing the work that brings the transformation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So when I when yeah. I start when I when I start my programs, I'm also going to charge very. In fact, I do charge very well because I realized yeah. in the days when I used to offer free coaching mm -hmm. and cheap coaching, mm -hmm. people didn't take it seriously. Seriously, but yeah. now when they know they have to pay. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely it's different. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Okay, we're almost rounding up. You know, how, how do you juggle the competing demands on your time? Okay, so in the past, not so very well. And okay. I'll, I'll disclose that I did suffer from burnout in 2020, 2021. Okay. And that, that was probably the second time. Mm. And you'd think that I would have learned better. But basically, mm. how, do I, how do I juggle the competing demands of my time is the fact that I'm very, very, very clear now what my values are. I'm clear on what my vision is. Mm -hmm. And so if whatever is competing for my time mm -hmm. doesn't align with the greater vision that I have for myself mm -hmm. or doesn't align my values, it's a no. Okay. So I get asked to speak at a lot of events. And so, so I know exactly what I say yes to, and mm -hmm. I know now know what I say no to. Mm -hmm. But the reason I had burnout in, in that period was that even though I knew better, I wasn't doing better because okay. I was in a new partnership, a business partnership that mm -hmm. didn't al allow me to fully express or mm -hmm. be who I truly was. And mm -hmm. it was, I needed to get out of that mm -hmm. in order to get to mm -hmm. get to where I am now. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Cool. <laughs> what do you think of this podcast and what we're trying to do? Do you know what, Daniel? I love your podcast. I love the stories that people share. I always pick up something when I watch well, these don't, don't say this, just... Just oh, no, no, no. I absolutely Give me the real, the, real, the real spiel. The real spiel about what I think about your podcast yeah. is freaking brilliant. Well okay. done. Okay. I, really, I really love that you're doing this. And mm. we, need, as we need to share more of our stories. Mm. And uh, I'm wishing you all the best on your, mm. on your journey. Fantastic. Really, I absolutely, I, I do love it. <laughs> anyway, Catherine, <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you on our, on our show today. I'm sure our viewers are going to have lots of comments. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, I'd like you to um, obviously leave comments. If you've got questions as well, you can leave them in the comment section and we will try to answer them in future episodes. And um, I'd also like to subscribe. We've gone past the 550 something, 560 mark. Yeah. Our goal is to get to 1000 in the next month or two. Yeah. I'm hoping that we your episode and Ellie Kemp's episode which is coming out as well in a, a, a next week or week after should get us past a thousand subscriber base so it takes a lot you know I've traveled thousands of miles you know to to bring you this content and the least you can do to help is to click on the subscribe button and click on the bell notification so that you don't miss out on any future episodes and I'd also like to thank a few people who have helped us in this journey. Um, Akosia Bami Ashiabo, um, Akosia um, Abna Ose Labi, uh, Abna Kerr, um, Nane Usua Finn, uh, amongst others who have helped us in various ways to um, get us to where we are. You know, we started this podcast with nothing but my iPhone and, and that was it. And a cheap micro microphone on, 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 on Amazon. 
But fast forward a few months, we've got proper studio grade equipment. Um, we've got microphones that are like top notch. You know, we've got a whole production set up. We actually have a studio where we do our shoots now, all the way in Bushy. You know, so we're grateful for the people who have supported us, the people who've been with us on the journey. Um, I'd also like to say a very big thank you to um, one of my biggest supporters. Who doesn't want to be named? But I, I call the person um, 1M, the person who <laughs> understands. So 1M, uh, this episode is for you. Oh. And thank you very much for your support. And uh, see you next week. Catherine, oh, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. I really much. appreciate you coming thank on. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you.